people. But hello, we have a very special guest here today. I'm going to fire this up. And here we go. And of course, the stuff ringing in the background, which is crazy. I'm here today with British Huddle. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. No, no, it's a pleasure. You and I are very aligned in so many different ways. And people are asking, when could you have him on? Do more interviews because it'll be interesting uh, to go over a ton of different stuff. And I think this will be extremely valuable to the community as well. And we're going to talk about a lot of things that I think are near and dear to people who invest. We're going to touch on yeah. predictions. We're going to touch on Bitcoin, a lot of Bitcoin market dynamics, where we are, um, supply crunch, multipliers, the ETFs, which is just, you know, people were like, oh, it's a nothing burger. No, it's not. <laughs> not at all. Uh, we'll talk about psychology. Um, maybe we have a lot of people from the UK as well, very interested in your perspective of Europe and the UK. Maybe touch on a bit of macro and debt. And uh, I, I'm a big believer as well in psychology of investors. And I know you do some work in that realm as well. And maybe you have some tips that will help people kind of wrap their heads around the world. But before we jump in, Hope you're doing well. Hope you enjoyed the week. Bitcoin right now is 47,500. All good? Life is good. Yeah, life is good. You know, we've, we've regained all the Selden news, fear, FUD, bullshit yeah. uh, in 22 trading sessions. If this was a year ago for Bitcoin, that would have knocked our blocks off. You know? Oh, yeah. So I mean, and, and there's some very crazy things happening. Like from a large perspective, we'll go into a little bit of breaking news because there was a lot of breaking news today as well. But uh, one of the things that's very interesting about this cycle is literally, I think the big elephant in the room, two things, it's a double barrel shotgun almost. One, we're going into diminishing supply, long-term holders at 78%, and the amount that's available is going down. And second of all, Bitcoin was just classed as an asset by TradFi. I mean... Could there be a better perfect storm or would you be able to add a third leg to that stool to blow the world up even more? I, I don't even know. How do you do that, right? Like it, it the, the Bitcoin on January, January 11th, 2024 went from a risk asset to a must asset like, yeah. what, what, for a $900 trillion liquidity market. It went from a risk asset to a must asset. Like, how do you how do you even wrap your head around that? Yeah. You know, it, it is phenomenal what we're living through here, and every single person who is living through this should should count their blessings because this is unlike anything we've ever seen. We've never, firstly, we've never seen an asset that has finality of supply, yep. right? Never seen that. Right, we can do good by getting close to it by artificially trying to adjust the. We've never seen an, an asset with uh, with with finality of supply, and then on top of that, we've never really the world, our generation, has never really lived through the financialization, the securitization of an asset, and uh, both of those things are happening right now. I don't know what could be num what what could be the third thing. I I, I have no idea. What I, 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 I think the, 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 the only way to blow this up would be a big nation to adopt it. You'd as, need a G7 nation at this point. Not even G7. Because El Salvador is not exciting to me. Yeah, it's it's not that big, but it is it is a roadmap for other nations. But something big like a top 50 nation, that would change the game. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, as I've been saying for a long time, if they turned, you know, say for example, an element of the BRICS currency to use Bitcoin for trading energy like oil, that would be a game changer. That would be Overnight. exciting. But yeah. then again, like, you know, the BRICS thing is, I think, overblown as well, because, you know, personally, when I analyze it, it's like, well, if I've had to convert my dollars into one to send to you to buy oil, and then you take those one and convert them back into dollars to, to put them to use, then what's actually ha what 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 illusion have we ran here? And what's the net effect? So I don't mm -hmm. know. I think there's a lot to be seen on, on the BRICS uh, stuff yet. I think the U.S. is going to hold its power quite quite well. Okay. Well, before we jump in, what I'm going to do is um, go through a couple of very quick slides, and then we'll run through an agenda. And first of all, I don't smoke, but I thought this would be a pretty cool image of you and I having a that, cigar together a instead. Cool instead, we're having tea, so we have our tea mugs, and this is, this is my... Go. 
This is my London mug. And then I have another one, too. Got two big cups of tea because I finished my coffee for the day. It's England. So cheers to you. I appreciate it. Cheers to you, sir. And everybody in the UK. 40% of my viewers come from the UK. Believe wow. it or not. But let's, let's jump through a little bit of uh, news today, uh, a little breaking. I covered it briefly this morning in what I call the quick and dirty, the ETF update. We had the second biggest day ever, 9,000 Bitcoin taken out of the system. And I'd like your point of view on this. You know the daily emission is 900. 10x pulled into nine ETFs. 10x the actual daily supply pulled into yeah. nine ETFs in a day. Now, can you, yeah. in your own words, explain supply crunch? I've been trying for years. I yeah, well. I mean, look, you know, we, we're dealing with a situation where we've now got ETFs that have unlocked 10x the demand that we've seen in any in any bull run, right? We've unlocked 10x the demand. And at the same time, there is an absolute finality of supply based on Bitcoin. And more importantly than that, on a daily basis, there's only 900 Bitcoin a day coming out. You know, when I first got into Bitcoin, I told one of my gold friends, because I was in gold at the time, and, and I told him, you know, he was ri ridiculing me for getting into Bitcoin because of, I guess, my own opinions on Bitcoin six months before that. And, uh, and, and I told him, I said, if you can tell me every single gram of gold that was mined yesterday and where it's gone and who holds it, right, then I'll put 50% of my net worth back into gold right now, hmm. right? And of course, you couldn't do that because you can't do that with gold. So, you know, we, we're experiencing the world getting used to the idea of absolute scarcity and absolute clarity of information around where everything is yeah. and, and where it went. And, and of, of course, there's going to be demand for that. Like, who's stupid enough to think that you have finality of scarcity when you've got all these other assets that have been in demand that don't have finality of scarcity? Yeah. But now you actually have finality of scarcity and what there's going to be no demand for that. So this is this is to me, this is just the beginning. I think a, bit, a better metric to, 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 to track, which is really exciting for me, but not really exciting for you for YouTube, I've noticed and Twitter is is the average. Right. Mm -hmm. There's been about 40,000 Bitcoin that have been accumulated across the entire US ETF market, including GBTC outflows. That's 2000 Bitcoin a day that are being ch chewed up by these products. Like we've never had a demand source that's been consecutively chewing up 2000 Bitcoin a day in Bitcoin, in the market. So yesterday's 9,000. Yeah, so yeah, even bigger exciting. than that. So that's, and, and the other cool thing about kind of Bitcoin is now I know there's only one ETF that actually shows their actual live address where you can monitor what's in their bag in real time. But that is so cool because imagine trying to do that for a gold ETF. It's like, where is this gold? Does it even exist? Is it gold foil <laughs> wrapping a piece of lead yeah. or something? Anyway, other yeah. other other breaking news too. Uh, so far this month, the two most popular ETFs on the planet are iBit and Fidelity Bitcoin ETF. Uh, did that take you aback? Not really. Not once I saw the flows start to like. Once I started analyzing the flows for the first like week or so. Um, I was like, okay, well, these are going to be monsters. Um, and then I, I think that there was more trades on the Bitcoin ETFs in the, f in the first day than QQQ, right? Yes. Once I started seeing things like that, I was like, okay, no, these are going to be monsters. But for, I mean, to have the most popular ETFs ever in the launch is, is quite quite nice so yeah it's it's good work bitcoin's good good work right now who, who can not be proud of bitcoin right now it's uh and, and some of us have been very patient for a long time and we'll get back into your history with bitcoin too because i know all about that as well but there's more etfs it's not just an american story breaking news hong kong will have their etf probably right after the halving so we're talking 65 days from now um yeah. and you know um you know, former Commonwealth place, Hong Kong, but now it's kind of the financial hub for China. And there's nothing the mainland Chinese like to do more than what? Getting the money out of China. <laughs> so, 100%. Uh, and they have a lot of money. And this, this is, this is not spoken of. People think, oh, Hong Kong is just a small little island. It's, not, it's a nothing burger, but no, no, no. Um, do you have any insight into what's happening around the planet with other ETFs? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I said um, 
when I, when everyone was saying, no, this ETF in the US wasn't going to get approved, I said, not only is it going to get approved because BlackRock has filed, but mm -hmm. after that, you're going to see a series of approvals because everyone leans on the SEC for guidance. And then, you know, people kept telling me, okay, but what about these Canadian ETFs, these Swiss ETNs, et cetera, et cetera? How come they haven't performed well if you think an ETF? Well, it's because America runs capital markets. Mm -hmm. So you can have all these products, but if your boss is not is telling you not to, to allocate to it, then there's nothing you can do. All these products are just going to sit there. But now their boss, aka Larry Fink, is now out here selling Bitcoin to everyone. So yeah. it has now become, you know, not only a non fireable offense, but it actually is a fireable offense if you don't sell the BlackRock product that is Bitcoin, mm. right? So, um, you know, that, yes, of course this was going to come. And of course more is going to come uh, because now uh, Larry Fink and, 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 and Fidelity and BlackRock and all the armies that are involved there are now on board. Yeah. And then we have another angle too. It's this, uh, love him or hate him. He can be, I, I'm a, a fan of Michael Saylor. I've I love known him. him. I've, I've known him since the, the uh, mobile and analytics days and way back and all the good stuff he did in the world. But what's interesting about MicroStrategy now, not only they have 190,000 Bitcoin, in fact, the ETFs now have 11,000 more already. They've leapfrogged MicroStrategy real fast in just well, 20 well, days. Well, let's correct that. It's the new nine ETFs. I like yep. to look at the whole snapshot. Yep. But if we just want to analyze the new nine ETFs, which also include pivot of capital from GBTC, then yep. yes, they have more than MicroStrategy. But I don't think that's exciting to look at as me personally. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because one of the things that people say, oh, it's just, it's not really the new ETFs are not really taking in a lot of new Bitcoin. It's just people pivoting from GBTC into the new nine ETFs. I have a theory, I can't put my finger on it, but the f I believe the fact is that a lot of the money that was trapped in Grayscale was not long-term Bitcoin investors. They were more speculators. So what yep. percentage would you give to, say, a, qu a quarter of Grayscale has been drained in 20 days? How much of that quarter, which is a quarter of 619,000 when they began, how much would you say 150, 160,000 Bitcoin gone? How many of them would you say were speculators versus are pivoted into like BlackRock or Fidelity right now? Yeah, I mean, based on what I've heard from James and Eric at Bloomberg, I would say it's somewhere between, they said like 30%. I, I, I think it's higher than that. I, and I think there was a 30-day wait window, which is now expired, which is what we're starting to see capital trying to front run that now. So I, I think that um, it's around 50% has come yeah. back in to Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin exposure. But that's still a significant 50% that's been absorbed by the market. And you know, we're, all, we're at prices, right now we're at prices that are basically the day before the ETF launch. Exactly. Well, the good thing about Sailor is he's also preached far and wide to institutions to make Bitcoin a treasury asset. The reason they haven't jumped in is because of the FASB rules, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, but that's changing. I think at the end of this year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, do you believe that will bring about Bitcoin treasuries for institutions? Bitcoiners hate me because my opinion is no, I, I don't mm -hmm. think that's going to make a big impact. I think Michael Saylor is a genius and I will continue to say that I've met him and I, and I think he's, one of the fastest thinkers I've ever met in my life and probably will ever meet. And yet, I, I think that he is a one of one uh, with MicroStrategy. So yeah. I, I personally do not think that there will be other companies that put 90% of their treasury into Bitcoin. Now, is there companies that are going to put, you know, low single digit percentages? Sure. But 90% yeah. like MicroStrategy? No. Okay. Imagine, imagine you're Apple. You're the CFO of Apple. you got $150 billion in cash. You know it's a melting ice cube. You know it's debasing at 10 to 14% per year. Would you not yeah. allocate 10% of that $150 billion into Bitcoin just to offset the melting nature of your cash? Maybe, maybe. But again, that's not Michael Saylor, right? That's yeah. not Michael Saylor style. And the reason is this, because if I was the CFO of Apple and I presented to the board that, hey, you know what we're going to do? We've got all this cash that we're sitting on because uh, you know, because we're sitting on it and we need to put it somewhere. So I'm going to put it into Bitcoin. The shareholders, the first question they're going to ask me is, why don't you just give it back to me or do share buybacks? 
like if you've admitted that you have nothing to innovate on, nothing to invest this cash in, you've got nowhere to go with this. Why don't you give me back the cash in the form of share buybacks or just paying a bigger dividend? And I'll go and put it in Bitcoin myself by reducing the risk by buying the ETF. Because remember, if a company is holding that Bitcoin for you and that's where your returns are coming from, there's like five orders of risk involved in the company doing it versus now me clicking sell on Apple and buy on the ETF. So that, that's the thinking that I think CFOs will be terrified of. And why I know that is because Tim Cook was clearly on CNBC a couple of years ago and, and they asked him this question. And his response was, we're Apple. We're, investors want to invest in us because we want to innovate into the future and, and build the future that we're creating. If they want to invest in Bitcoin, they can go do that themselves. He knew that back then. Right. It just sends to me, it sends the wrong message. And this is why MicroStrategy has had to pivot now to calling itself uh, a Bitcoin development company, yeah, because exactly. really the business in, in overall eval, the business really isn't worth that much. Right. Compared yeah. to its Bitcoin holding. So either you're a de facto ETF or you're 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 uh, you're a the, you're a software company that has Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Which one is it? So that's the struggle that they're going through. And again, I don't know whether you saw it, but on the 28th of December, I put out a video saying, as much as I love Michael Saylor, the opportunity of holding MSTR doesn't make sense to me because it looks like it's overvalued by 40%. And then 15 days later, it dropped by 39%. <laughs> but it bounced right back too. It, it's it's a weird thing. I spent a lot. I spent a lot of time playing the R of a microstrategy. It's it's been one of my favorite things to do that's ever since August twenty twenty. Yeah, it's yes, brilliant. That's very smart. That's yeah. the game to play. The game yeah. to play is the ARB opportunity. But guess what? Once you now you got professional market makers in play with the ETF. You don't think they're going to go? Okay, you know it's now ten percent below the value of of Bitcoin, so we're going to pump it up to 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 square. Oh, now now it's ten percent above. So the spreads are going to become a lot thinner on that yeah. and that's that's your you know that's opportunity now for very intelligent traders not the average trader exactly well we have nearly two and a half thousand people here already everybody i always wait to do the big intro because it's wasted at the beginning but british hodl's details are below he has a great youtube channel great follow on twitter and we'll talk more about the social stuff and dealing with trolls later. But we have a little more breaking news to get to because it's just a crazy day. It couldn't have been a better day. Thailand, all of a sudden, want to become a digital asset hub. Yet another. Amazing. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, listen, look, I think uh, there's been a lot of news around Asia trying to become this, the Middle East trying to become this. Everyone's flying to Dubai to Bitcoin conferences and all this all this stuff. I, I put out a tweet yesterday. I was like, everyone flew to Bitcoin, flew to a, a Dubai Bitcoin conference, spent 10 grand on a flight, which is 0.21 Bitcoin, which will be worth $210,000 <laughs> when Bitcoin's a million dollars to basically learn to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense to me. But uh, all of these countries that have been talking about becoming the digital hubs, they haven't made real progress, correct? Because my tax residency is in Dubai, right? So when I'm dealing with Dubai banks, they have an issue with this. Right. Because the banks haven't found the frameworks yet to do it. So the, the governments and the regulations can say what they want until you have the financial infrastructure to deal with this. Uh, it, it really is, you know, them trying to chase headlines. So, you know, I, I from what I understand, they've actually reduced the tax down to zero uh, and they've done a couple of things, which great. That, that's all great. We'll see. And I, and I hope it works out. But really, the market that I'm focused on is the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Um, everywhere else is is trying to, you know, ride on the coattails. And, and that's cool. And I hope it works out for their country. But they're not really my main focuses. Okay. Uh, a little bit of ETF stuff, because I know you monitor this correct carefully. Yeah, the interplay between Fidelity and BlackRock one day one spikes the other one the other, the other one spikes is that the t plus one t plus two offset there's no way it could be so distinct or is somebody pressing a button on aladdin within blackrock or the equivalent system within fidelity for allocations why why this mismatch here like red for your edification is blackrock and blue is fidelity and arc yeah. grew a lot as well don't discount arc they're the third biggest player yeah, listen, look, here's the thing that I'll tell you, right? Like if you are BlackRock and you are Fidelity, you, you have so much information around around how the market's going to pan out compared to everyone else, right? Yeah. So if I've got BlackRock, there was an announcement, I think by uh, one of the, I think it was Vanek, 
that the CEO of Vanek, I can't remember exactly, who came out and said, BlackRock's lined up $2 billion to go into their fund as this opens, right? Yeah. And so on the first few days, we just saw a trickle. And so far, we've seen a trickle of that $2 billion. We've seen a lot of capital rotation. But if I was BlackRock, I wouldn't be dumping my $2 billion right on day one. Right. What I would do is wait for the price, let all of this supply hit the market, wait for my ETF trading desk to let me know that, you know, we've hit the bottom on the on the supply orders. And then my allocations guy will go and send that two billion dollars over and start buying at the bottom of the market. That's what I would do if I was an, if I was a smart asset manager uh, for my clients. So I think what's going on here is that Fidelity and BlackRock are trying to figure out, like, when do we allocate this capital that we've had assigned to us? to put into our funds. And that's the race that they're going against here. And then you're gonna have the T plus, uh, T plus one and two uh, issue as well. But I, I really think it's more of them fighting for first place here. Uh, and their, their teams in the background trying to figure out how and when do we allocate the capital that our investors, investors have told us to allocate into our funds. I don't even think they've really started buying yet. I think yesterday was the first day that we started seeing some real buying. Mm. Interesting. Let's, uh, well, let's jump out of that for now. Sorry about that. Keep on. Somehow it's <laughs> the intro is integrated with the screen share. So ah, they, I, I'm not very good at this stuff. Very good at other things, but not good. this stuff. I think you're pretty good. I think you're being humble. I think you're yeah. pretty good. No, no, no. But let's, uh, let's, let's go into some kind of detailed questions. So there's a lot to talk about here. And that was just the breaking news, by the way. We're already, I don't know, 20 minutes in. Thank you again for your time and happy Friday, everybody. Um, Bitcoin's valuation prediction. People love this stuff. You came up with an aggressive one of 1.29 million. And that was, I think, based on the Bank of America study and 1% allocation from BlackRock from Fidelity. Uh, you're probably the only other person I know that has modeled this as much as I have. I've been building I what I call the IA multiplier. And I reverse engineered the impact of the Tesla 1.5 billion buy to calculate the impact on Bitcoin price. And that gave me 21. But that was a long time ago. And Bitcoin's a lot harder now in terms of supply and scarcity. But I still use that 21 to be conservative and sandbag stuff. Can you walk us through your philosophy of your 1.29 million target and when? Yeah, like my when I first got first had the light bulb moment for Bitcoin, my instant reaction was the world will put 1% of its capital into this. And so this 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 thought process is really, you know, everyone's so excited about $3 billion going into BlackRock's fund. It's, let me put this into perspective, right? That is 0.03% of their assets under management, right? Yeah. If they want to get a 1% allocation, they need to buy $100 billion of Bitcoin. And that's just BlackRock. Mm -hmm. Fidelity needs another $45 billion to get it to get to their 1%. So my thought process is 1%. Uh, you know, we add a little bit more for the asset, for the other asset managers that we have there. You're, you're looking at somewhere between 145 and $230 billion of purchasing going on over the next few years based on Bank of America's 118 multiple at the peak of the market, right? At the, at the very tip of the market, um, you're looking at a $27 trillion market cap, which gives you a $1.29 million Bitcoin price. Very logical, very simple. How long do you think that would take? I think you're looking at a cycle to a cycle and a half to ma maybe two cycles, but I think it's a cycle to a cycle and a half from okay. this point. That's interesting. So what I've done is I've built so many price targets and allocators. And one of the things I look at is the, the 32 trillion. They're just the big money runners and Schwab is coming. It includes Schwab, which have double. Schwab's another eight, right? Yeah. They have double yeah. what Fidelity have, which would be big. But the numbers get bonkers real quick, even even at, I think it's one third of 0.1%. The numbers are already yep. six digit Bitcoin. Yep. You know, so that's, it's nuts because the yeah. world has never experienced, like, if this was happening with gold, what would happen is the price starts running and suddenly governments start issuing permits to mine gold. Investors come in and start talking about mining more gold and investing in gold miners and all this other exploration projects. Um, and that drives the price back down again. 
right? Yeah. Because there's suddenly all this extra supply of gold. So with Bitcoin, it's like, you want to put in a trillion dollars into Bitcoin tomorrow? Well, the supply stays the same. You want to put in $10 trillion? Well, guess what? The supply stays the same. We've never experienced anything like this before. Yeah. That's why I always say it, it drives probably the gold bugs mad. I always say, you want more gold? You dig deeper. That's it. It's just right. what you said. So uh, I love that. Okay, let's talk about um, some kind of market dynamics. And we can, we kind of touched on corporations and, and balance sheets. But what about hedging as some type of risk? Like, do you ever think Bitcoin could become kind of a contra asset to managing risk for a business? in any perspective? I, I think for me, Bitcoin will remain a risk on asset until the US dollar dies, mm -hmm. right? To me, the US dollar is the risk off asset, right? Whereas whether people want to agree with that or not, that's how financial markets see it. Because when everything's going to go, going to hell in a handbasket, people want US dollars. Until the US dollar is actually at threat, Bitcoin's going to remain a risk on asset. And it will be on the long tail of risk on until its compound annual growth rate gets down to, you know, I don't know, 10 to 15 percent over a five year window. And that's going to be a long time away. Yeah. OK. In terms of, well, from your investment experience, you've come from traditional hard assets like gold. What was the, I know you, I think was, was it 2017? You had 20 Bitcoin for two weeks and you doubled and you took your profit and ran. Thanks for very, reminding me. <laughs> very famous story. <laughs> but uh, what was, what was the penny drop moment for you to get back in, in 2020? Yeah, listen, look, all of my friends were lawyers, all of my friends were real estate investors, all of my friends were gold people, and everyone, you know, used to basically talk about in the text, in the group chat that uh, Bitcoin was a scam and look at this thing, look at these people getting screwed over and whatever. Um, and then 2020 came around and a friend of mine who's a lawyer left that group. Uh, and then I said, hey, well, you know, what are you doing? What are you working on? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, I just made a big allocation to Bitcoin. And immediately I started ridiculing him, of course. Uh, and he said, before, before we have a conversation about this, I want you to listen to the Bitcoin standard. Yeah. Um, and because he was someone that I respected, I was actually open to hearing it. So I listened to the Bitcoin standard during the worldwide flu season that we all had walking around, <laughs> uh, walking around the park in London. And um, as I'm listening, Saifuddin Amus mentions the idea of stock to flow hmm. right now stock to flow is morphed into this thing or you know on the model and the price model and i love what plan b's done with that but just the idea of stock to flow being applied to bitcoin i'd completely missed that i was looking at bitcoin like like an equity not like a commodity uh hmm. and i guess with my gold investment background as soon as he said the word stock to flow, it was almost like the matrix opened up in front of me. Light bulb, boom. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was weird. I froze in, like yeah. I was walking while I was listening to this book and I just froze because I realized I'd messed up big time. Because it's stock to flow as well fascinates me because it's a, I say painting with a broad brush, but it gives you kind of guide rails as to where mm -hmm. hard assets go. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the stock to flow of real estate is 120. Basically, Something like that, yeah. It re re replenishes itself every 120 years. Gold is heading in that direction pretty soon. Or not gold, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And, and you know, I, I do believe in stock to flow because I've actually mapped it for Palladium and a whole bunch of other assets. It is, you know, kind of like... It's like two regression lines. It fits in between quite a lot. So I'm glad you said that. But it was also very unfortunate, the ridicule that Plan B got <laughs> during the last bull run. You know, you Listen, probably... I think that's unfair. Yeah, yes. I think that's unfair. I mean, every person is entitled to express their theory. And he always said, this is a theory. This is a thesis. And I think the morons in, because listen, there's morons in every space, right? There's definitely morons in the Bitcoin space. And they all tried to attack him when, and none of them could have been able to even explain what stock to flow was. Uh, and, and they attacked him for, for, for expressing an idea, right? I think his idea has done, if his idea was so terrible, Fidelity would not have put it in their brochure to send to their clients about Bitcoin. 
right? So again, it's just an idea, and I think he went through it, and I don't think he should have because I think everyone's ideas, you know, should be critiqued. Yes, but I think what he went through was unfair. But it's coming back on target. The question is, what's going to happen with the having? Uh, I did a piece again. The people were at Upper Norm. So it was a, a group called Milk milk float or milky way and they wrote a piece that they believed all the action is 90 days before the having and 90 days after the having most of the volatility we're in that window right now have you analyzed those time frames down to that small window of six months because if i it, haven't okay I, I haven't i i of course know i'm aware of it but i i haven't really spent time analyzing it because i don't really trade bitcoin right it's not something i trade i trade other things but I don't trade my, my Bitcoin. Uh, so I, that's really not relevant to me from a big, pure Bitcoin perspective. Yeah, there's also, um, this takes us to uh, a conversation that I know you've spoken about a lot too in the past. And ever since 2017, I was, what got me was the hardness of Bitcoin, how it you can't get more supply. And when you look at yeah. 21 million, then I started digging into how many were lost over the years and that will never reappear. It's about 5 million. So you're down to say 14 million, 14 and a half million now. And people are still losing the Bitcoin every day, you know, yep. boating accidents, etc. The importance of whole coinership. I used to say to people in 2017, 2018, 2019, if you've got two kids, buy two Bitcoin. It'll cover their education in 10 or 15 years or 18 years or whatever else. They all thought I was nuts. I don't think one person actually listened to me. And then I try, I, the reason I'm on YouTube now is I made a video uh, for my, for my friends at the club to, you know, get for them to be convinced of Bitcoin. And that actually went viral. And that yep. is the history of why I'm here right now. And my friends don't listen to me, but people on the internet got it real fast. Well, what have you what have you done around educating people around whole coinership and how important is that today? And I know it's becoming more and more out of reach as time goes on. But what would you say to people if they do have one? You know, when I first started learning about Bitcoin, there's amazing, there's such amazing education out here. I wish I had some of this education when I was in real estate, equities, gold, stuff like that. Like, you have to put in such little, little effort to get there. And I just didn't see people putting in that effort unless they were already winners, right? And so for me, my goal is to understand why people take action. And unfortunately, people only take action when there is enough fear or enough greed. Mm. Um, and yes. so my role that I see myself as on, on YouTube and being in public is to generate enough fear or enough greed. Because once I can do that, there is so much amazing education, so much amazing uh, content for people to watch. But I consider my role as getting people interested in watching everything else that's there, um, that's out there. So for me, yeah, get to one Bitcoin. If you don't get to one Bitcoin, your, your, your last name will mean nothing, right? Your progeny will die with you because you have not taken the action to get to your one Bitcoin during this bear market that you've had the opportunity. I'm getting messages from people in the Philippines, from people in third world countries that have worked their behinds off to get to one Bitcoin during this bear market. And I'm getting people in the UK, in America, in Canada, in Australia, telling me that that's an unfair thing to say because not everybody can have one Bitcoin. Well, guess what? Not everybody wins all the time. And Bitcoin is a monetary network, not a, not a social get triggered and make everyone happy network, right? Mm -hmm. It is a monetary network, which means you have to own enough to actually win. That's what people yeah. don't realize. You have to own enough. And I think that enough is one Bitcoin. I think everyone should do what they can to get to that one Bitcoin if you want your last name to mean anything. I mean, a lot of people right now don't want their last name to mean anything because the way the world is going. And that's fine. In that case, why are you holding Bitcoin anyway? You're just being greedy. Donate it to the system and lose your keys. But everyone else that wants their last name to mean something, wants their progeny to actually have a foundation, you need to get to one Bitcoin because I think that's where the North Star should be. And it's at least one Bitcoin, right? That's yeah. what the, I think that's the safe space. And uh, you, you mentioned Seyfedean Amus, who's a brilliant person and uh, reading his book got me onto the 14% 
melting ice cube debasement fiat bandwagon and the logic is so clear and so simple it's perfect but i also had robert breedlove on the channel and he said bitcoin is an iq test i know it's a bit of a harsh thing to say but you probably know exactly what he means do you believe bitcoin yep. is an iq test okay I, I think i think there has to be a little bit more empathy Right. A, a lot of hardcore Bitcoin maxis who have not had experience with other assets and what drives people to buy real estate, gold and equities and stuff like that will believe that. And, and to a certain extent, it's true. But th I think there has to be a certain amount of empathy for people like my parents, which is really who I started my YouTube channel for. Right. The, the immigrants to the United Kingdom spent 35 years doing the exact right thing, buying property because they thought that, you know, that was going to be the one thing that would help protect and build a legacy for their two sons, only to realize that their properties have to be worth 50 percent more than they are because of the supply, the ability for the government to manipulate the supply lever on the asset. Um, and my goal is really to help people in that position understand that this work that you've done for 35 years, if you want it to mean anything, you need to liquidate a small fraction of that and, 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 and at least own one Bitcoin. So do I think it's an IQ test? Yes. Do I think it's fair to say that? No. But then again, people will say I'm being harsh, right? But I think there has to be a little bit more empathy on, on people under, not understanding Bitcoin right away. And we need to help people understand that my way of doing that is to basically pull on the fear and greed levers yeah can, can we double click into the story of your parents and real estate because that was super interesting when i heard that kind of it resonated with me it also resonated with what people like michael saylor say in florida that you buy yeah. a house over 100 years it'll be taxed to death it's yep. kind of almost akin to like a a three percent management fee on a bitcoin etf or something if that was like in the old days, eventually it'll eat away a huge percentage of your gains. Can you tell us more about your parents and the real estate experience they had over 35 years? Yeah, yeah. look, when my dad, when my dad's side uh, of the family came to the United Kingdom because they were kicked out of, you know, Kenya and Uganda, um, they had to figure it out. They had to leave everything over there and come over and figure it out. And then what they realized was that property was the the thing that um was the vehicle that would help them build the wealth that they that they wanted so they started buying property the, the home that i pretty much you know grew up in most of my life they bought for five thousand pounds and, and you know 35 years later was literally worth five hundred thousand pounds right um and and if you if you analyze what asset most people who are under the $30 million level, right? 500,000 to 30 million, it's real estate. Why? Because it's the one thing that they can feel safe with. It's the one thing that they can touch. It's the one thing that they can rely on. And unfortunately, Wall Street, through the securitization process of mortgages, has decided to leverage that emotional trigger for people to, for the desire for normal people to feel safe and try and push them into real estate and turn this asset into the asset. The problem with that is, is that they started pivoting to equities, right? Wall Street started pivoting to equities. So mm -hmm. all of this money that went into real estate and, and gradually flows into real estate because the, poor, the average poor person gets told that you need to own real estate. Unfortunately, the government utilizes the levers that they have, which is the supply levers of permits and building permits and all this other stuff to make sure that the wealth doesn't grow as fast as, uh, you know, as fast as it should grow. Right. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, that leaves people like my parents with a bad taste in their mouth because now they get to the point of retirement and, 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 and they have to downgrade their life rather than upgrade. Think about that. You spend your whole life working, right? Yeah. You've, you've raised two sons, you, you know, you've got a family, this, that, and the other, and you get to the end of your life and now you need to downgrade your life. You've done the right thing for your entirety of your life. You've done the right thing. And now you expect, now you're expected to downgrade your life because someone else was pulling on levers that you couldn't understand. That's a, that's, that's a crime to me. A total crime. And I see that uh, we have, there's a stores in the U S called Walmarts. And sometimes you see people who are like 75, 80 years of age working because they can't afford to pay their rent or the medical. Anyway, let's, let's, let's talk about this chart for a second. This blew me away. And it's just, it's Australian centric, but it's the same all over the world. 
And what it is, is a, it's from Check on Chain. Everybody can check it themselves. It's basically the Bitcoin, Bitcoin price in Australian dollars is the black line. Uh, then the average home price in Australian dollars is the green line. But the point is the average house price in Bitcoin is the kind of orange shaded area you see there. And it shows yeah. you how houses are getting, despite going through the moon in terms of price, they're getting cheaper and cheaper in Bitcoin terms. And if you look at the makeup of certain economies around the world, like Australia, literally the housing market is the backbone of the economy. It is yep. everything. If anything happened everything to that, yeah, it's crazy. Now, to put it another way, the end result, if this continues, would be the absolute decimation of the Australian dollar. And of course, all fiat around the world as the government inevitably prints its it to backstop the system. And in Australia, the whole system is very real estate dependent. And as you say, UK and Germany and other places, and Bitcoin consistently outpaces the inflation rate of Australian housing and outperforms stocks. Stock is on there too. It's one of those lines I can't quite see, the Australian stock market index. So to young people today, and I always preached it's good to have three pillars, you know, have a house, have a castle, because you need somewhere to live. Don't pay rent because you bleed bleed all that money out. And it's also a great way to get a leverage investment, put 10% down, get a low three-year or 10-year fixed rate at 3%, which is far lower than monetary debasement. And everything is great, and it'll appreciate over time. But when you look at this, does that shatter the thesis that everybody needs to have? real estate or should they just buy bitcoin what would you recommend to a 25 year old today yeah I, I personally i don't own any more real estate at this point in time um and that's because i think bitcoin is the best value proposition at this point so the only reason i have to own real estate at this time in my life is for investment purposes however when i get married and have children i, I will definitely buy a house or two but again, that will be completely off my balance sheet because to me, that is not an investment. That is, a, you, you are building an empire at that point and that is a base for, your, for, for, for everything to grow. So I think you should buy a house once you understand your purpose and you have enough capital so that it doesn't factor into the, um, the overall investment portfolio that you have. If your house is going to go on your net asset balance sheet, then I think you should probably be owning Bitcoin. But if you can buy a house and if you're at the point of building enough wealth where you can buy a house um, and it doesn't matter, it is the house that you want because of the, the future and the purpose and everything else that you want to create, then I think that's when you buy a home. I, I don't think there is any reason at this point for people to buy houses, especially, you know, a lot of the argument is cash flow, right? Well, if you're a smart investor, as soon as the options get activated on the Bitcoin ETFs, you'll be able to sell long tail out the money covered calls and generate way more return than any real estate will give you. And then you get the benefit of flexibility. You can move around the world. If people's things start screwing up in the US, you can pick up and move around the world. You don't need to worry about your property. You don't need to worry about, uh, you don't have to, you don't have the bags and the chains holding you down. And I think that's one of the, one of the issues with real estate at this point. Okay, I'm gonna take that same question and pivot it because I get this a lot. If you had the choice to buy one whole coin or use that money to buy one whole coin and use it as a down payment on a house? I think I know your answer. <laughs> yeah, you I'm doing? buying the whole coin. Yeah. yeah I'm buying okay. the whole coin. Great. Um, in terms of uh, kind of... Can, you, uh, just, can I just make one, one yeah. point? Like the buying the whole coin decision is because I believe in myself, right? Bitcoin is a decision to believe in yourself. It is a decision to believe in the future that you can create. It is a decision to believe uh in 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 this world that we are that you are emerging into real estate is a decision to basically accept the world that has that has been built for you right because if you just think logically and factor out the returns that my grandfather and my father got on that on that home that i grew up in five thousand pounds to five hundred thousand you really think that house is going to be worth 56 million pounds over the next 35 years versus the last 35 years it's not happening right? Because there'll be riots on the street. Real estate is the easiest asset to control. And it's the one asset they must control mm. because people need a roof over their heads, which is why, why now 
the U.S. government is contemplating trying to get all these hedge funds to force sell all the properties that they bought. Right. So I think that, you know, real estate is a choice of the past. You must own a home once you have a purpose for it. But as an investment opportunity, it is a it is a choice to live in the past not a decision to step into the future, which is what I think Bitcoin represents. Okay, you just opened up another Pandora's box in my little head. All right, so one of the things that I used to look at when I was investing in real estate is demographics. I used to say, follow the bodies. Where are the people going? Right. Okay, that's where the growth is, where the industry is, and that's where the real estate appreciation would be. Now we have a weird situation where all the big money homes are held by people 65 year old plus who are downsizing but these are very expensive homes they're multi-million dollar homes in many places some five some 10 million in very nice neighborhoods that you said you, like like your parents they bought for maybe five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars 40 50 years ago it's a different world now the problem we have though is the kids today don't have that five or ten million to buy this house What's going to happen to all that expensive real estate when the boomers start shedding it? Exactly. And what happens when, when okay, so the boomers start, start shedding that real estate. So they're going to take a 30 to 40% write-off on there, right? Sounds like a little bit of a wealth tax to me, but let's, let's not, let's skip that for now. They take a 30 to 40% write-off on their dream home, downscale it, right? Now... The government realizes, wait a second, you've got all these boomers downscaling their, their properties. And now the houses that we want the middle class to actually buy, the young people to buy, is being bid up even more because of these older people that are trying to downscale. So now we need to force all these hedge funds to start dumping those single family homes that they've got. And they start dumping them onto the market. So what happens here, right? From a boomer perspective, you've done all of this to try and control your future and your legacy and all this other stuff. Just as you get to the end of your life, you've now got a de facto wealth tax, right? Because you've taken a 30% write off on the home that you were living in to sell it. Now they're going to force a flood of single family homes. So you're going to put that money into a, into a smaller home and that's going to go lower in value because that's the only way you keep the population happy without rioting. You need roofs over people's heads. Uh, otherwise they're going to start rioting. So yeah, this is a, this is a, this is the wealth tax, right? Because the wealthiest are in equities. When you look at the, de the demographics of wealth above 30 million, it's mainly equities. It's not, it's not real estate. And then Whereas they borrow against them. They borrow against them to live. Yeah. Exactly. And they write, right? they write off so the interest. Can, yeah. Exactly. You can only, you can only take from someone that where, where the thing is physical. Right. And so they are going to use real estate as the de facto wealth tax in the USA rather than introducing a wealth tax. This is, this is my core fundamental belief right now. And I don't think anyone should be screwing with real estate over the next 30 years. So the second time you mentioned riots and it tells me that you have a bit of a dystopian view of the future. And I have that as well because I'm very fearful of things like AI and automation, robotics, and also Many, many of the younger people today, they're not studying the right things to be prepared for the future. They're not ready for the future. Um, do you believe the future could be very dystopian? Central bank digital currencies, uh, UBI, all that good stuff. We're already seeing signs of it happening everywhere. But what's yeah, your take? I, I think central bank digital currencies have to come. I don't, I don't think there is. You might be able to postpone them for five years, but I think they have to come. Um, I think that um, the world in the west i worry about the west because again i this is where i'm from this is my home the special relationship that the united kingdom and the us have is extremely important to me so when i think about the dominance of my home country and the united states of america it's extremely important to me and i think we're making bad decisions now the 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 worst decision that we have and the worst path that we're walking down is the demographic issue right all of our countries are below the replacement birth rate. The, the advantage that the US has and that the UK has is that we can import people. Borders are open. Right? Yeah. We can import people. Come on people, in. Right? <laughs> Even if it's not illegal immigrants, yeah. we can, if we decided that we have a population crisis, we could pass a law and start importing people. Guess what? China can't do that. Right. So the one advantage that I think is that over a period of time, over the next 25 years, I think China is going to see a degradation like it's like no one's ever expecting. Uh, 
I think that's going to fall apart. Their birth rate sitting at 1.3, 1.3 per woman, and that is going to destroy China. Yeah. What I worry about is the period between today and in 25 years, because when you look at the demographics in the United States, the conservatives are outbirthing the liberals by two to one. So what that tells me is that the liberals have basically done the illusion on themselves, made them believe that the world is not a good place and therefore they'll just die off uh, over a period of time. And the conservatives, which is sort of the politics that I lean towards. Um, and, we'll, and for, we'll, for we'll, the people we'll, that aren't aware of US or British politics, conservatives would be right and yes. liberals left. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the, I think in 25 to 30 years, the United States could be the best place in the world to live. I worry about what we what happens between today and in 25 to 30 years time. So I don't know what happens there. I think governments are going to go through a very, very tough period. I think people are going to go through a very, very tough period. I think there's going to be a lot of instability as this new world emerges and as people's wealth basically gets taken from them to, to continue reducing, uh, you know, these inflationary effects to allow more money to be printed. So I, 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 I struggle with that. I don't know what happens between now and 30 years time, but in 30 years, I think the U.S. is the best place to live. And speaking of money printing, uh, you're familiar with the 70, 77% tipping point of debt to GDP, and we're far beyond that in many nations around the world. There's no coming back from the debt spiral. I'm sure you believe in that concept too. Yes. The one thing that I have in mind, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is if you ran inflation right at 9%, mm -hmm. Uh, for a period of four years, you could actually lower that debt to GDP ratio quite efficiently, yes. right? And you could do that through CBDCs and printing money and just handing it out to people. So it's like prices go up, but people's lives don't really get that bad. Maybe a little bit worse than it is right now, but it doesn't really, they don't really feel it too much, but that allows you to kick the can down the road for another 50 years. What do you think of that? Yeah, they definitely can and they will. And that's the beauty of central bank digital currencies because you can control inflation through controlling wallets. And say, right. hey, British HODL, I know you want to buy that new, say, car or vacation or whatever. I'm going to put a stop on your wallet and you can't do that. And therefore, you can't inflate the price of that asset. And that's the power. And yes, 9%. In fact, I also believe that Inflation is far higher. I, I used to look at apples at Costco. It's a grocery store thing. And you buy these organic apples. You used to buy a big tray of 12 for like four bucks. And then it became a tray of eight for six bucks. <laughs> and then it became eight bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks. So you had a combination of shrinkflation and massive price escalations just in four to five years. It's insane. Yeah. And, what are you uh, talking about? Who needs to buy apples? Apples shouldn't be in the basket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but that's just an example. Don't get me started on blueberries. Um, <laughs> but but uh, it, it is really incredible. And people, people see it. And there's always the joke of that meme with the shopping trolley 20 years ago. It's full of stuff for 50 bucks. And now it's empty for $100. And that's exactly yep. true. Now, certain things are coming down in price, like electronics. You can buy a 100-inch plasma TV that probably would have cost 10 grand five or 10 years ago. Now you can get it for $600. Who knows? But that it's, it's kind of a combination. So you're dead right. That's the only way that nations can get out of debt is to inflate themselves their way out of it and also cook the inflation books, which is what they're doing too. Classic yeah, I guess so what we should do then in that scenario is build a bunch of Apple Vision Pros, put them on everyone's heads, feed them uh, liquid food so that they get uh, suckered into the lifestyle of Ready Player One. And then we just yeah. continue with the with the people that actually make the natural selection. Huh? Maybe that maybe that's a plan. Who knows? Well, there's a lot of that, too. There's other theories we were not going to touch on about controlling certain things, but that would be a separate, separate topic. Uh, all right. Let's talk, since we're on a somber note, we're going to talk about recession. The biggest concern that people have right now is everybody knows we're probably going into a recession, but we thought that last year. But again, I think we were in a recession. It's just the recession was in select industries and in select states and in select parts of the world. It's very clear Germany is having a hard time. I just looked at some recent demographics and data out of Spain. Shocking, like something like 30% of the youth under 30 are unemployed. 
or 35%. Yeah. It's true. It's like, how is this even possible? Um, yeah. This is very scary data coming in all over the place. But the question is, how do you believe a recession would impact the price of Bitcoin? In my mind, it means money printing, it means rate cutting, and that inflates Bitcoin. What's your thought? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you. I think that the inflation, the, the recession fears are way uh, overblown. Firstly, when you look at the data, everyone always has recency bias, right? So everyone thinks 2008 happened, which means it's going to happen again. And that's just not how it works. Um, holes have been plugged. And, and I don't think we, we, we might see another 2008 style recession in our lifetime if we're lucky. Right. But besides that, I don't think we're going to see one. So I think we've been through exactly what you're saying. Uh, you know, parts of the world are going through a recession uh, and that's good for 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 the overall balance of the world. I don't think the U.S. has been that affected. I actually think Jerome Powell's done a pretty decent job in the face of everything that that that's happened. Um, but yeah, I, I, if if a recession happens, we go straight to rate cuts. We go straight to money printing. The, 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 the overall trend line of, of money printing uh, overwhelms the, the, the diminishing value of risk on assets in a recessionary environment. So money, they, they cannot, the way I like to say it to people is we live in an inflationary system. The arch nemesis of, a deflation, of an inflationary system is deflation. So if that was to happen, there is no stop to the amount of money that would be printed because that is the ultimate risk to the empire. Yes. So the money will be printed. It's just a case of when. Uh, and, and I think they've built uh, you know, a landing, a takeoff strip for a little bit more money printing. So I think that's what's gonna happen in, in the near future. Yes. So bring on a recession, I guess. That's, it's, which sucks to say because the average person is gonna suffer, but bring on a recession. Definitely. Let's go back to ETFs for a second. We put all the doom and gloom behind us. Now, the ETFs are there. I noticed an anomaly. I watch Glassnode charts every day for on-chain analytics, and I saw a huge spike in old wallets, long-term holders, literally 90 days before the halving, get rid of their Bitcoin. And I'm like, what the heck? This doesn't happen at this stage of the cycle. What the hell's going on? And then I had a moment. This kept me awake for two or three nights. I was like, why? Why is this happening? And it became clear to me the only explanation was the fact that long-term holders are nervous about self-custody. They're ditching their self-hodl and moving it to an exchange, and they're buying the ETFs for security. Do you believe in that theory? And would yes. you do that? Okay. Yes, and yes, and I'll di dive into it, right? So I think for most people in the West especially in America, which is where most of the capital is concentrated, I think the ETF is probably going to be a better solution than self-custody. Do I want it to be that? No. I want to make that very clear. But the reality of how assets are held is very different to what I would want, right? Um, and so I, I think that most assets are not self-custody assets, and I don't think, I think, I don't think Bitcoin is going to be a majorly self-custodied asset. I think it will go into the ETFs because I believe in incentives and the incentives of owning the ETF are going to far outweigh the incentives of owning any self-custody Bitcoin. Because if you want to borrow against your Bitcoin and you come to me and say, hey, I've got a bunch of Bitcoin I want to borrow against. And I tell you, OK, cool. It's oh, it's self-custody. OK, it's going to be Fed plus seven percent. Right. Or, oh, it's ETF. Oh, it's going to be Fed plus 0.5 basis, point, like 50 basis points. Like, what are you going to do? Right. At some point, the incentives are just too powerful to put it into the system. And I think that's what most people will do. Um, and that's Bitcoiners don't like hearing that. But again, you know, most of the Bitcoiners that have those opinions don't have a brokerage account. So I don't know about their opinions. Yeah. And also margin is massive. I'm a big yes. user of margin and having yes. the marginal nature of the ETF is huge, especially if you can time. What the about, what about let's, talk, let's not talk about advanced trading stuff. What about simple hedging? What about simple hedging, right? You put it into the ETF, you go buy some puts. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, there's so many advantages to owning the ETF. And again, I always say, I've been saying this for a while. If you are a Bitcoiner and you are someone who is very passionate about self-custody, now is the time you should be shouting at the top of your lungs to educate people because Wall Street doesn't care. Right. And that's going to be the majority of the money. So I think the majority of the money goes into the ETF. Um, and yeah, I think old school holders will will move their Bitcoin. And I would consider doing that at some point, too. 
Well, first of all, we're at an hour already, and I'm not even halfway through. I'm, I'm good stuff. to go if you're good so, to Yeah, go. thank you so much. And a big thank you to everybody in the chat as well. Don't forget, British Huddle's details are below, and you can just see his knowledge and wisdom, and uh, please follow him if you want to get smarter, as we say. All right, so we like that self-custody thing, which is a controversial issue, and it's so funny. You mentioned Bitcoin maxis. They hate you if you buy anything other than Bitcoin, too, so... That's interesting. Actually, actually, while we're on the subject, how do you deal with toxic trolls? Because they're they, they, they're you know, amping up uh, lately. Look, most of the people that troll me have never done anything in their life, and most of the time, from the way they talk, and I know that's a silly thing to say, but from the way they talk, you can tell they don't they haven't gotten to one Bitcoin. And here's me talking about doom and gloom boomers, happy hippies, you know, uh, people that don't get to one Bitcoin won't won't the name won't mean anything. So it's like a part of me expects it. Um, and, and I and I look at it as sort of a counterbalance to the message that I'm trying to get out there. But I I think that my message is more important than the way I feel about trolls. So I, I look at the bigger purpose of it. I know my time on social media is not going to be long, right? Because once Bitcoin's passed a hundred thousand dollars a coin, it's like, what is? Who am I talking to, right? If it's if it's a hundred thousand dollars, it's the first time you've ever heard the term Bitcoin. You probably need four hundred thousand dollars of liquidity to make that hundred thousand dollar investment, uh, and therefore you're probably worth you know four or five million dollars if you've got four hundred thousand dollars of immediate available liquidity. So it's like, you know, it, it comes with it. I, I'm not here for a long time. I look at it like it's part of it. They're fans and they can keep talking. And I heard you saying that before and I found it a bit disturbing because I think the community needs you. So please don't go anywhere. And even, and I, I know what you're saying, your, your job is to get people on the train while it's still affordable. After 100K, it's no longer affordable. But I don't believe there's ever a time to give up hope. People should always be investing. So how would you counter that? Sure. But to me, Bitcoin is a monetary network with 21 million coins, which means at some point, if you own 0.1 Bitcoin and you feel good about yourself, that's great. You feel good about yourself. You're still completely and utterly irrelevant to the overall size of the network. At that point, what that means is you in order to make your point in the world in a monetary network, you need a certain amount of that monetary network under your control. So while I believe in the happy hippie, who, you know, high-fiving everyone just because you own a little bit of Bitcoin, I also realize that if you want your opinion to matter, then you need to own enough. And if, you're a, if you don't own enough, then what it's going to depend on is you rallying with others and, and grouping together to try and make a group opinion relevant, right? Which is basically what we have right now. Um, and so, yeah, like it's a sad thing to say, but you will do financially extremely well by holding a little bit of Bitcoin. But if you don't own enough, at some point, your opinion is just going to be exactly what it is today, which is worthless. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the always the theory of diminishing returns. Each cycle returns go down. I have a theory because of the ETF, because it's now a TradFi asset class, because we're going into diminishing supply for the first time ever through a halving cycle. Um, I think also last run, I think it had its head cut off because of manipulation and scammers and everything else. What's your theory on diminishing returns this cycle? I, I, if you gave me latitude for two cycles, I could say that I think it's going to break. Um, but for this upcoming cycle, I don't know yet. And the reason why is I'm on the phone with friends of mine and people I know who are Fidelity financial advisors, right? So they sell Fidelity products. And I'm telling them that they can type in FBTC into their, into their portal and sell the product. They don't know yet, right? They haven't been educated on it yet. So this upcoming cycle, I don't know. But the next between this one and the next one, it breaks. And do you believe if, if there's an analog to the gold ETF that I just went up for eight years, you know gold, you remember that era. Yeah. Do you think it's possible for the yes. big ETFs? Okay, good. Yeah, I, good. Think, I think it's possible for the cycle to break. I think the risk, because based on the ETFs, is rebalancing, and we'll see how that pans out, um, rebalancing of portfolios. But yeah, I think that 
Bitcoin is in for a very, very wild time. And that takes us to supply crunch. We kick this off by saying, okay, these things are sucking in 10 times the daily emissions in a day. That's going to be 20 times the daily emissions in 65 days. Right. When will supply crunch hit? Because these, because the ETFs are just beginning to advertise, and you said they're not. The guys aren't even educated. The guys and gals who sell the stuff aren't even educated yet. So we have a long, long amount of trajectory to come. True. Yeah. Yes, I think I think it kicks off around November. Um, that's when it's really going to start kicking off, because the noise will be enough. And by the way, if I was Fidelity and I've got internal funds with people that have got five billion dollars with me, right, in a four point five trillion dollar fund. I'm going to get them into Bitcoin first before I tell my low level advisors that only talk to single digit millionaires. Right. Of course, it's just the game of how it works. So uh, yeah, I think about November is when uh, we start seeing something kick off. But I mean, I don't know if you're looking at like if anyone's looking at the price today, but it's doing all right. Um, and, and I think that the supply I, I, may, I put out a tweet and I said that I think we get to eighty five thousand or above by by September. But I, I think the the real rockets don't turn on until November. Yeah, and that's it's not a big move. Like we're at 40, 40 let me see the exact price. 476 right now. Call it round up to 50k to get to 80 is not a 60% gainers and that can happen very fast. In fact, if you look at the uh, Bitcoin added 12% in the last three and a half days. Yep. <laughs> and that that's like, whoa, whoa, what happened? And you know, as yep. we say, risk happens fast. And it's exactly yep. the way sometimes things can move. Um, and if you look at like at one miner I look at called CleanSpark, it ba it more than doubled in less than five trading days. Yep. Yeah, it's just that's a good trade. I have that trade too. Oh, good. <laughs> so a lot of people here on this channel have a lot of CleanSpark, and it's an interesting company. But now sometimes things get a bit high as well. But anyway, let's talk about. Um, what, what's next in the book? I have so much, but I'm just, you keep taking me down different rabbit holes. Um, do you, actually, while we're on the subject of CleanSpark, you're not a Bitcoin maxi. You have different investments. Would you like to share with yep. the community here what you dabble in? Yeah, I mean, look, so I, I, I collect watches. So watches are a part of it. I sold a bunch of watches in 2020, the ones that I didn't love. So now I, the only amount of money that I have in watches is watches that I love. So I don't even consider that really part of my portfolio at this point, but it is because it's significant. Um, in my actual investing portfolio, I would say 50% is in Bitcoin. Um, around 30 to 35% is what I like to call layer two to Bitcoin, which would be like mining stocks. Mm. And then the remainder is in layer threes, which would be derivatives. Uh, on Bitcoin and the mining stocks. And, I, and I, that's how my portfolio is spread out. Yep. Incredible. And it was funny you mentioned watches because it was both uh, watches, things like Rolexes and collector automobiles went bonkers during what you call the global flu holiday or something. At the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, so if you had watches, you did well. But was I did, it, yeah. yeah. Did you sell any? Yeah, I sold I sold a bunch of my what I I sold all of my Rolexes in 2020 once I understood Bitcoin because I realized I didn't love them, right? They were yeah. just there. Yeah, I uh, I went through a little bit of a rationalization myself and I remember there's one little one little watch I sold and it very quickly I think it 8x in a very short window of time wow. because it was at a time when there was no supply and everybody wanted them, you know. People were bored at yep. home so they just sort of you know, and I'm thinking well, I could take that watch and turn into Bitcoin and then sell Bitcoin in a few years and then buy 10 watches and kind of like yep. your idea of the flight to Dubai in the beginning. Uh, super yep. interesting. Do you, have you track uh, disruption at all? I also look a lot at um, disruption, like humanoid robots and stuff like that and AI. Uh, if you were to guess which market would be bigger in the next 10 years, would it be AI and bots versus bitcoin wow um <laughs> wow, i don't know either question. myself that's why i do both so just in case yeah Hedge. yeah i think in terms of market capitalization across both i think it's going to be bitcoin hmm. uh because bitcoin is a problem that everyone needs solving um 
But the, the AI and the robot stuff is interesting to me. I'm certainly not looking at it as deeply as you are, uh, but it is, it is, it, it's certainly interesting to me. I'm very, very curious which way we go. I'm very, very curious how it impacts GDP. I think it is the new American Renaissance, by the way, uh, because if you can boost GDP, you can yep. you know, bring down the debt GDP levels and all this other stuff that we can do as well. So I think, you know, Unfortunately, America's best path forward is plugging people into the Apple Vision Pro and then letting the machines do the productivity. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> crazy, but you know, like how else do you get out of that debt spiral? You know, what, what about the baby making too? Uh, let the robots do that. <laughs> it's amazing. Huh? Can it's you awesome. imagine? Can yeah. you imagine if you can incubate a baby? Well, the, the neural link surgery is done by a robot because it needs to be absolutely precise to be able to plug into a nerve it's it's it, would you it, do it, that would you do that uh it depends yeah i i think i would if you know anything could happen to anybody there's um <laughs> I, I read a medical study sh shared with me by a guy called sanjay and uh, it was about a little blue pill and how it prevents alzheimer's believe it or not so yeah. uh i don't touch drugs at all i'm a drug-free zone but you never know what could impact anybody. And if you did have a chronic illness, I'd be very open to fixing that. But, would so. it, but what would be your threshold? So it would have to be a chronic illness for you to, to get to, to sign up yeah, to that? To risk it, yeah. Can you, imagine, can you imagine the world in 30 years where people will just be like born and then say, okay, we're going to get the chip installed? It's not even 30 years away. It's three to five years away in my opinion Unbelievable. it's very very close Speaking and then it's crazy because if you don't do that for your child right now your child is at a competitive disadvantage to everyone else yeah it used to be uh living in, in san francisco you know it's the the rich asian families would spend fortunes on a thing called kumon and other extracurricular classes mm -hmm. for the kids so they could be the best in the class um now it'll be who can buy the best chips for the kids' brains to help them in school. If they even go to school, maybe they just have that Vision Pro thing again. Speaking yeah. of people who need chips, um, politicians, regulators, and again, we're, you're taking me all over the place here. We see two worlds diverge. You've got anti-crypto factions in certain regulatory government bodies, and they got pro. It's obvious you, you can't deny innovation. You just suffer if you do. What's your take on global financial markets and regulation and government's approach to crypto? And this talk of, say, the United Kingdom being pro-crypto and then against it. And if you have a HSBC account, they won't let you plug into an exchange or any of that stuff. We're, we're, what's your view of the whole world? And then, you, as we showed at the beginning, Thailand, Hong Kong, Dubai, all these emerging markets jumping headlong into crypto. Yeah, I personally, the way I look at it is I don't think it's governments. I think it's the I think it's the private interests, right, that fund the governments that are causing the issue. I think that Elizabeth Warren has no clue about what Bitcoin is in order to write a statement. Right. I think there is a special interest that she's being funded by that is doing that. The good news is Elizabeth Warren has a has a has an amazing track record of zero for passing bills in the USA in her entire career. So she is literally a puppet. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a positive. But overall, the incentives won. Uh, and again, you got BlackRock now. So the, the, the largest uh, financial lobbying uh, team is on the Bitcoin side at this point. Um, so we'll see, do I, you know, what do I think of the UK and what the UK is doing? I think the UK is lost at this point. I think we left the, the, the European Union and we've not become our own man. And I think we've got to make a very sharp decisions in the United Kingdom to actually allow us to do that. And we're not doing that. The reason why the, the, the UK doesn't allow selling of American ETFs is because of EU law. It's nothing to do with UK law. It's, it's EU MIFID laws. Um, the UK could immediately repeal all of that and open up to American capital markets, but they're not doing that for some reason. I don't know what the reason is, but it's for some reason they're not doing that. You know, it's quite stupid in the UK, right? If you're a UK citizen and with a UK uh, broker account, you cannot buy an American. So you can't go and buy QQQ, right? 
you have to go and buy the EU wrapped version of QQQ because they need a key investors documentation or some, some BS like that. You know what you can do though? You can sell a put on QQQ and take delivery of the asset. Did you know that? You know how crazy that is, right? So what they're basically doing is trying to knowledge out the middle class from making the best decision for their wealth. And then when you go buy these EU funds, if QQQ's uh, expense ratio is, 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 is you know, 0.5 basis po- or five basis points, they're charging you 1.5% in Europe to invest in the same asset. You're literally buying that fund 1.5%. They're taking the money and putting it straight into QQQ and, 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 and paying the, the, the five basis points over there. The, the EU is a cancer on Europe. Um, and, and I think it should be fixed. And I think the UK, which was the bastion of we're going to do this, uh, has fallen. Um, and of course, we've made terrible political decisions. We saw an absolute coup in our politics. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's terrible to see what's going on with the United Kingdom. I'm very, very big fan of the United Kingdom. I was born there, got all my opportunities from the UK. And it's terrible to see what's happening. And I wish we elect a leader fairly, not like what happened with the last one, who I think was a good choice. Um, and we had a new leader installed, in my opinion. And I think that, you know, I hope the UK makes better decisions because otherwise we're headed to a very dark place. Yeah, what's so interesting is the the DNA of the UK is kind of, for 400 years, it was the global head of financial markets, you know, to a large extent. You know, a lot of stuff was developed there, things like insurance out of Lloyd's of London and a lot of very creative yeah. stuff. I think all the euro dollar business was started in London, correct? Yep. So it, it's a shame that it's become so draconian where they're putting, clamping down everything and in innovation and everything else. And it, it, I also fear that many are being left behind of this opportunity because they're probably not even allowed to talk about it or don't get a chance to hear about it uh, yep. with other folks. So what would you say to somebody, say, in any country in the world where they are in a draconian, uh, whatever, infra- infrastructure regulatory environment, what would you do? And do you believe in the future of DEXs down the line? And leading to that, fiat on-ramp is the big block. How do you get yeah. cash onto a DEX? Because I think DEXs will revolutionize everything and peer-to-peer trading. I'd love your take on that. Yeah. Um, I think peer-to-peer trading and DEXs are going to be for smaller markets and the trading on them might sound big to an individual person, but it's going to be irrelevant in the overall capital markets. So that's what my opinion is on DEX is. What do I think someone should do if they're in a draconian uh, financial environment? Leave. <laughs> that, that's it. That's the, only, that's the only solution that you have at this point. Mm. You have to leave. You have to set up a new residency somewhere else and you have to leave. That's why I left the UK. Uh, you know, three or four years ago, because I knew this was coming, right? I knew this was coming. And so, yeah, I had to leave. I had to set up uh, my my investments in, in other jurisdictions where you can actually invest more freely, more friendly with the USA. Um, and yeah, it's, it's terror. It's so disappointing to me what's going on in the United Kingdom. The fact that a normal person can't buy an American SEC approved ETF from the UK is, is, it's so disappointing. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, we have a lot of people watching from the UK. I see Vanessa there and others, and I hope it's not too disheartening. But I also believe that we're going into a world where everything will be what I call gig. There will be gig jobs, gig housing. People will start being much more nomadic, much more mobile when they can, when they're not bound down for other reasons. Uh, do you believe in that future too, where people could just have, we used to say uh, when I used to work, you know, have backpack, will travel. Like you literally got your backpack and your laptop and change your clothes for two days and you go anywhere in the world and you just live out of your laptop backpack. Yeah. And that was it. Um, but do you believe there could be much more of that happening in the future where people with, say, digital assets become digital nomads and start floating around the world? Un- this is going to sound weird. Unfortunately, yes. 
right? And and the key part there is unfortunately, why? because the reason why the United Kingdom was an empire, the reason why the United States is an empire, is because people chose to focus on the most important project that they could focus on, and that was new innovation, new technology to help their home country grow. And so, yes, there will be a lot more nomadic movement around the world. But if we want to see strong countries, we want to see our country strong. We need talent. I would love to go and fix things in the UK and add to the UK, but the environment doesn't allow me to, right? If I don't want to invest in real estate, I'm not really welcome in the United Kingdom, right? Even all of the Lords in the United, in the House of Lords in the UK have most of their assets managed from a Caribbean island. Right. So it's it's unfortunately, yes, I believe more people will become nomadic. And while they think it's a good idea, I think they will lose purpose. I think they'll lose vision. And I think that um, the empires need to do a better job at bringing people back to incentivize people to help build that empire into what it what it can be. Hmm. Super interesting. And <laughs> it's been a. I like to end on kind of more upbeat notes. Uh, I've got through kind of everything that I think I wanted to ask you. We went all around the world on that one, and I really appreciate your time. This but we do great. have a couple, yeah. couple of cool questions from the audience. Um, one is from Matthias Cardacci. Sounds Italian, maybe. Uh, hey, British HODL, your 85K for September is a little bit bearish. Why aren't you bullish AF? <laughs> I said at least eighty-five k for September, 85. so it, it could go to it could go to five hundred thousand by September. Who knows? Exactly. Then we have Puli Chakravarti. Um, with the current rate of permanent loss of Bitcoin, what will be the available Bitcoin say after three hundred years? And if its finite supply and permanent loss don't go together. Bitcoin days are numbered. I've never heard somebody talking about 300 days into the future for Bitcoin, but uh, have you looked at the permanent loss of Bitcoin? No, um, because to me, that's a donation to a network. So I, mm. I don't I don't really spend my time thinking about uh, it's like if if people care about it, they'll they'll look after it. It's simple as that. And of course, there's always the Satoshis, too. So you got a hundred yes. millionth of one Bitcoin and and there will come a time in the future where Satoshis will mean something. I think last time I calculated, there's about 35 Satoshis to the penny, if I'm not the US penny, yeah, something like yeah. that. I need, to, I need to create a little automatic calculator for that because I get it. And you're dealing with 100 million or something. It gets really confusing. Um, yeah. A question from Lizette Delgado What happens if there's a grid attack uh, with no monetary system? A lot of people are worried about, you know, a lot of people are also worried about things like ETFs becoming too powerful, holding too many Bitcoin miners, holding too much Bitcoin and being able to influence the actual protocol itself and grid attacks. Do you have any concerns about that? Or is that something that the upside is far greater than the small percentile risks of downside? It's not even that. It's just that the, the, just understanding what Bitcoin is, is uh, takes care of those risks, right? Bitcoin is built, built on nodes and nodes are, are decentralized, right? So you can own as much Bitcoin as you want. Um, you cannot impact the Bitcoin network and its choices on what network to, to support and what to what to do. So that's more of a problem for the ETH 2.0 holders, because if BlackRock gets enough ETH, guess what? It's about proof of stake at this point. So they'll be able to dictate everything that's going on. And I guarantee you the first thing they'll do is they'll remove your unicorn dress wearing CEO and they'll put someone else there that looks a little bit more like Larry Fink. So you better be worried about that rather than Bitcoin. Hmm. And then we have a final question from Jimmy Neal. Uh, you are so right, British Huddle. The U.S. should open the borders the same way my grandpa came from Ireland for a job and safety. Why not solve the debt Ponzi with open immigration? Yeah, I think I think that's a solution, right? But you shouldn't. When people say open immigration, it's been put into the point of like, you know, let's just open the borders and welcome everyone in, like Texas was doing the other day uh, with the Supreme Court and and all that stuff that was going on. It's not what I mean. The United Kingdom and the US should basically say, if you have a viable job offer, 
where you are earning more than $35,000 or 35,000 pounds a year, you are welcome to come and work here and stay here. That's it. We should clamp down as hard as possible on, Ill on illegal immigration and open up legal immigration for people with jobs, for people with opportunities to come to our countries. Unfortunately, you know, and this is opening up another rabbit hole, but those people don't really vote in the way that the agenda wants you to vote, in my opinion. Hmm. Interesting. And I'm just doing a quick check on the Bitcoin spot ETFs today. The volume for BlackRock was twice GBTC. So it looks wow. like we could have another another strong day when we get the numbers yep. tomorrow out there. So that was the marathon as Kiwi Robin and Digital Asset US and Digital Asset News and all these great people in the audience. We're very grateful for the time you spent with us. It's a very enlightening conversation. I'm very grateful. I learned a lot. And everybody I, should have totally my pleasure. We should have as many perspectives as possible because the future is not unicorns and rainbows. And we need to be self-sovereign and prepare in some way. Even that means maybe perhaps getting some ETFs too. Uh, any question for me? Any other question for me before we wrap and let you get on with your weekend? Yeah, listen, look, I, firstly, I want to say thank you, right? I really appreciate the invitation and come on the show and have this conversation. I love the, I love this style of conversation where we're just discussing everything. I really want to know what you think about these AI and robots. That, that's what I'm curious about because I don't really know much about that. Like, what do you think? How do you think that market is going to grow? Like, where do you think the growth opportunity is for that? Well, I've had a Tesla for over five years. I have FSD. And Do you I'm like F it? Oh, yeah. It's incredible. I still have the same time. I hate, <laughs> I, hate them. I had one for a month. In, I hate them. But I'm oh, glad you like it. I have a Model X. And uh, it's very fast. It's very safe. It keeps you out of trouble. It keeps the car secure. It's got a security system. It has the same tires, nearly 50,000 miles. Um, zero maintenance. Nothing's ever gone wrong with it. It's just... Like, I will never, ever buy anything else other than Tesla. Never say never, but really? that was my plan for now. Yeah, they are phenomenal. The electric? But a big part of it is safety. So not far from where I live, um, one physician in the U.S. took his wife and two kids off a cliff, fell down 350 feet onto rocks. Everybody walked away. He tried to kill them. His mistake was driving off a cliff in a Model Y. And wow. California Highway Patrol has picked up dead bodies from the bottom of that cliff for 80 to 100 years. They've never seen anybody survive. The only reason they survived is the Model Y. So safety is a big part of it um, and the features and convenience and a very low cost of ownership. It's insane, especially with the Tesla wow. insurance as well. So it's a, it, it's worth it. So, But my concern regarding the future, obviously UBI is coming. People are going to be displaced. AI is going to have a huge impact on the job market. Um, there was a report I saw about people like copywriters, people who used to write for a living. That industry has gone. That disappeared mm -hmm. in six it's months. Done. <laughs> yep. Done. And that's just the beginning. Next, you and I will be able to make up our own movies or screenplays or whatever by just saying, hey, write me a screenplay on, you know, Orwellian times with central bank digital currencies and UBI and the impact of AI. And boom, there's the movie. Done. Better than anybody could write one. And that's already here. Um, and then I was at the Cybertruck event when they launched a Tesla. And I walked the production line for two hours. It's completely automated. There's no humans on the line. It's completely automated. And then you have wow. Ford and GM and Stellantis fighting with the UAW about, you know, getting, you know, retaining jobs and everything else. It's just the world is just changing so fast. People can't wrap their heads around it. So I am, I'm both excited, but also very concerned for the changes that are coming. I don't think the world is ready for the disruption that is coming our way, not only in digital assets, um, in changes of the way we work and the way we travel and the way we're more nomadic, but also the disruption brought about by AI and automation. Yeah. It's going to be staggering. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting, I don't know if I can even wrap my head around that. I need to, I need to focus on Bitcoin for now. And then once the, once that mission's done, then I can start thinking about robots. Like, holy shit, holy shit. I didn't think I was going to be wondering whether robots would be worth more than Bitcoin. 
Yeah, well, they, I worry mostly about the younger generations, you know, people who are, say, 10 or 12 now in school and what they're learning. It's not relevant. It's, relevant. it's not yep. at all relevant at all. They need to be trained, you know, first principles thinking and creativity. Things that they need to be trained on things that bots cannot do. But you think when you go to when when you go to like higher end universities and higher end schools, that's what they teach. It's really amazing when you think about it. It's like if you've got enough money, you learn how to think. And if you don't have enough money, you learn how to work. Hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's but I also do believe in the democratization of education. I think there will be a big opportunity there too. I think if somebody has the own their own initial internal drive, they, anybody now can do anything they want. They don't need an Ivy League university. I went to one and I was very disappointed with everything that happened over the past few months. Um, the reaction of University of Pennsylvania, I went to Wharton Business School and you've heard the stuff from Harvard and I can't remember the third one as well. But it's just, they have lost their way. You know, mm -hmm. which is kind of sad as well. And do you need to go there for four years anymore? No, no. You can learn everything you want on YouTube if you have yep. the drive or, yep. qu or qu querying an AI system. And that's, so the scary that, 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 that's an interesting point, right? So then what are we doing to develop drive? Because drive just, you know, a lot of people like to, to just think, oh, if you have it, you have it. I don't think that's true. I think you can develop drive inside of someone. I don't think empires get put up without development of drive. So how do you even in that world develop drive when everyone's just focused on scrolling TikTok, wondering what to protest on next and, and looking at what television shows on their Apple Vision Pro next? How do you yeah. develop drive? So I think the best way for somebody to de develop drive in somebody young is have them compete in sports or chess or jujitsu or whatever. That is where the innate drive comes from when people learn to compete. You don't learn drive from staying home and sitting on the couch and being fed TV or video games or something. Competition is critical. And then yeah. you learn to become the best, and then you take that with you later in life. And that's probably the most important thing I'd tell anybody who has young kids, who's raising young kids, is have them compete in whatever they like to do. Make sure they like to do it, of course. If they don't like to do it, they're not going to be successful. But, but then what happens when they're told, oh, you shouldn't, feel good about winning then no that's bs <laughs> winning right? is of everything course it's, of course it's bs yeah, yeah. but that's the they're, they're trying to do that in in california with schools they're trying to take trigonometry and other things off the syllabus because it's too complex for the kids Unreal. It's like, yeah it's like no no it, the, the the old expression maybe it's a british term the school of hard knocks maybe it's a u.s term i don't know but yeah. People need uh, hard times. What's the old expression? Hard times make strong men. Soft yeah. times makes weak men or whatever that is. Yeah. It's very, very true. People need to go through suffering and competition and tough times to become better people. If you've never well, that's suffered, the good thing about Bitcoiners, right? Because Bitcoin is going to be the <laughs> hardest of people that you've ever met because they oh, can yeah. actually have made it through the gauntlet of the volatility. I think once you get used to the volatility of Bitcoin, nothing's ever going to phase you in this lifetime, right? Once you've been through a couple of cycles of Bitcoin and you've seen your wealth go, <laughs> go up 20x, collapse down 15x, it's like nothing's going to phase me in this lifetime so i think yeah. that is uh, the good thing about bitcoin is that we are building tough people in bitcoin yeah. and unfortunately the people that are not bitcoiners are going to be the weaker side of humanity uh because they haven't learned the lessons that bitcoin wants to teach you which is that scarcity is the only thing that matters on this earth yes, exactly. everything else is irrelevant right um and so yeah that's what i think bitcoin teaches overall and hopefully it will help fix some of this bs that's happened in society that you and i are skirting around the conversation of as much as we can <laughs> exactly right, rather than we getting canceled. So, exactly you know, I've been canceled before. Yeah. I mentioned one thing once and uh, I was taken down. Anyhow, um, there's a funny meme as well regarding Bitcoiners. I think there's a guy, he's on a very scary roller coaster and he's just sitting there and everybody else is screaming <laughs> their heads off. And that's exactly what you're talking about. So I yeah. love that. Excellent. Well, British Huddle, thank you so much for your time. Everybody, please hit the like on the way out. Show this man appreciation for all the time he spent with us. An hour and 33 minutes. And My all pleasure. his details are below his YouTube channel, his Twitter. Follow him, subscribe. 
and get smarter with British Huddle. British Huddle, happy weekend. Thank you so much for your time. Let's do this again. Maybe that. we'll do a an X-rated version on your channel or something and talk about all the stuff. We're not, we'll, we'll do it on, what's, it, what's the other channel that doesn't censor stuff? Um, Twitter? No, uh, t- Twitter. No. <laughs> Twitter is a nightmare. Because uh, because I've hijacked. Bum Rumble, that's it. Yes, yeah. we could do one. We could do a Joe Rogan esque type show. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Listen, buddy. My friend, thank you very much. Thank no. you. Very, I sincerely appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Beautiful conversation. Such a fun interview. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you all for coming, and I'll see you all soon. Bye bye. <laughs>